So the question I have for you this morning, or multiple questions, is why do we worship God? What purpose do we have uh, to take the time to give glory to Him, to worship Him? And how often do we take the time to do this, aside from Sundays as we have been this morning? How, t how often do we take the time to do this throughout the week when we're not together worshiping at church? Well, that's the question I have for you, that we're, what we're going to be considering and looking at this morning. Uh, last week we looked at Psalm chapter 1 as we begun in the book of Psalms uh, and we saw the ideas and the topics being introduced that we see throughout the book of Psalms. Uh, in the, Psalm chapter 1 it spoke of the righteous man versus the wicked man on the other side. But today we are going to shift our focus there from the wicked and righteous person and on to God himself and also our role in his creation, his created order, what he has made. So today we're going to be looking at Psalm chapter 8. Uh, Joyce already read a few verses from there this morning. Uh, so Psalm 8 is a different type of psalm from Psalm 1. Psalm 8 is a hymn of praise. It's a song of worship of the Lord. It indicated in the heading that it's a psalm of David. And it's written to the choir master. So it was meant to be used as a psalm that would be sung uh, by the choir or by the congregation. As, we, as you will see as we read through it, it speaks of creation. It takes our minds back to Genesis chapters 1 and 2 by using much of the same language that you see throughout the creation story. It speaks of all the works of God's hands and also speaks of humankind's special place among creation since the beginning and our dominion over the creation and over what God has created. So our focus is on sharing this worship of God as this psalm was meant to be a worship towards Him. It shows our thankfulness toward God for all the blessings we have received and the special place that we have in the world in the created order that God has made. So before I go too far down the road, let's read it together. So I'm going to be reading all of Psalm chapter 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the Son of Man, that you care for Him. Yet you have made Him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned Him with glory and honor. You have given Him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under His feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is Your name in all the earth. So, something I hope that you notice as we read the psalm is, is the repetition, where the first two lines are both at the beginning and at the end of the psalm. So when you see repetition like this, especially in, in one chapter like that, it's important to notice it and to ask why it's there. What's the purpose of this repetition? And there's something that I was taken back to this week in reading and studying um, that is used throughout the Bible that I learned about when I was in Bible college that's known as a, a chiastic structure. You may or may not have heard of that before, um, but the word chiastic means crisscross. So it's kind of like one thing there and then the other thing, it's crisscrossing and it's working together to bring focus to a certain part of the passage. Using repetition, sometimes it uses the repetition of phrases or ideas, sometimes it uses opposite ideas on either side. Um, and in the psalm that we're looking at today, as I mentioned, it uses the same phrase at the beginning and the end. So there's the phrase at the beginning of the end. Next in line comes the similar ideas on either end of the passage. So verses 2 and 3 and verses 6 to 8 are both speaking of the majesty of creation, the majesty of the created order. And as I said before, the, these chiastic structures, they show up throughout the Old and New Testaments. They're common throughout uh, the Bible, as you can see as you read through it. Um, from yourdictionary.com, it says, The power of chiasmus, or the chiastic structure, is to add emphasis. emphasis. Originally, as a rhetorical device, which was used as these things, as these chapters were spoken orally, it's a tool for speaking persuasively and for bringing focus onto a certain idea. And from a, another website, it said that chiastic structures are found not only in the Bible, 
but found in classic literature like the Iliad and the Odyssey. It's also seen in songs and novels and common idioms just to bring focus onto a certain idea or a section of ideas. So because of the way that it's structured, the way that it is designed to be read and understood, we're going to work through the psalm that way today, not from beginning to end, but from the different sections. So first we'll be looking at verses 1 and 9 on the outside, and then verses 2 to 3 and 6 to 8, so the next in the middle, and then finally ending with the third section, the middle section, the focus of the chapter in verses 4 and 5. So verses 1 and 9. As I mentioned before, it's the, the repetition there. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And you may notice in your Bible, it's kind of hard to tell, you may skip over it, but the first and in the last, when it says, O Lord, the Lord is written all in capital letters. So there's a reason for this, why it looks differently. In my Bible, at least, it has the, the first Lord is all capitalized, the second is not. But when you see this, it means that the Hebrew uh, for this, when it was written in Hebrew, it would have been YHWH, also known as the Tetragrammaton. It's the covenant name for God that was given to the people of Israel in the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verse 14. If you're familiar with the story, Moses is standing before the burning bush, hearing from God as he's preparing to go and stand before Pharaoh. And Moses asks, well, if they ask me who sent me, what shall I say? And God tells Moses, say, I am who I am, has sent, uh, has sent you. I am who I am. This is the name that God gives. And this is the name that is here. Y-H-W-H, as in Hebrew, they don't write in the vowels, or Yahweh, or Jehovah. It could be written J-H-V-H. So Yahweh or Jehovah, this covenant name, I am who I am. And interestingly enough, as I was looking through and studying, the Tetragrammaton, this Y-H-W-H, the name Yahweh, appears in the book of Psalms almost 700 times. And it's the only book of the Bible, the only other book to have it occur more is the book of Jeremiah. So Psalms is, really has the name Yahweh in there many times. And this name Yahweh, God's name, was held by the Jewish or the Hebrew people that would have had the Old Testament in such reverence that they would not even say it when they came across it in the text. As they saw it, they would either skip over it or they would substitute another word such as Adonai, which is Lord, which is how we see it written now, in its place. They had so much reverence for God's name that they wouldn't even say it. They would replace it with something else. And notice that also the phrasing in this verse, it not only says, O Lord, it doesn't say the Lord, it says, O Lord, our Lord. He is referred to in these verses, our Lord, as it shows the personal relationship that these people felt with God as they were his covenant people and he was their God. And next we hear the phrase, how majestic is your name. So think about the word majestic. When I looked up the definition, it was not very helpful in particular where it just says majestic is defined as having majesty. Okay, so what is majesty? Majesty is defined as sovereign power, authority, dignity, and greatness or splendor uh, of quality or, or character. So sovereign power, authority, dignity, greatness, splendor of, author of quality or character. So saying that God's name is majestic, that our Lord's name is majestic, is saying that it is far above any other in power, in authority, in greatness, in splendor, all these things. But think of when we use this term today in our world. The only term, the ways I could really think of it is like when a person is speaking to the queen, they say, your majesty that shows that they have a certain position, a certain power, they have the royalty, they have a certain title when used towards a person. Secondly, I thought of when we might use it in nature. Maybe there's a majestic view of a mountain or an ocean or a cliff or whatever it is. You might use that word. It's showing the beauty and the awe that you have for the thing that you're using that word for. And as mentioned before, that the Hebrew, the Jewish people had so much awe and respect and reverence for the name of the Lord, Yahweh, so much so that they would not even utter it. They would either skip over it or replace it. So consider yourselves, how do we treat the name of the Lord? 
How do we react when we hear his name? How do we react when we think of all that he has done, all that he is doing, and all that he will do for us? How do we react when we hear someone take our Lord's name in vain? Does that pain us? Do we say something? How do we treat God's name? Lord, we thank you for your wonderful, your beautiful, your majestic name. And we thank you, God, that you are so good to us. And notice also that it says that his name is majestic in all the earth. So not just among the people of Israel was it to be praised, but throughout the whole earth. Even if not all the people recognize and give his name and who he is, the glory and the majesty and the respect he deserves, his name is still majestic. For God does not need anything from us in order to be viewed as majestic, as glorious, in order to be holy, perfect, loving. He doesn't need anything from us. He is fully complete, fully perfect, fully God, whether or not humanity chooses to worship Him or not. Yet, even though we as humans are so limited, so fickle in our love and so, so limited in our worship of God, He loves us. And he gives us, he gave us a privileged place among his creation, as I mentioned before, and as we see in the rest of the psalm. Even though we do not love him and we may not have faith in him, he still loves us so much. And thank God for that. Thank him for that. So next we see the next section, verses 2 to 3 and verses 6 to 8. We're going to be looking at those together. So it says in, at the end of verse 1 really, it says, his glory was set above the heavens. It is established. The glory of God is established. It is set. It's higher than the heavens. Higher than we can even imagine. It's above the heavens. More than we could imagine. And then next we see out of the mouths of babes and infants. Even out of those deemed most insignificant. Children. And many times they're cast aside. They're thought less of. They're looked down upon, especially in certain cultures. But even out of their mouths, the mouths of those most insignificant, most probably not listened to many of the time, the praise and the glory is spoken of God from them, so much so that it is enough to steal the enemy and the avenger that would come up against God and His people. Because it's not the worshiper, it's not the follower, it's not the person who is significant, rather the one being worshipped as we look at him this morning, our God, who is being worshipped. And then we hear the words where it says, look at the heavens, the glorious moon and stars. Think of the heavens, the stars, the, the moon, the galaxies, the planets, the infinite stars, solar system, galaxies, all created by our God. I think of this week at I was at football practice and seeing the, the clouds roll in, the lightning and the heavy rain and just looking at the skies, it's amazing to even think and to see that that could even take place. And then driving home, seeing the heavy rain behind me and the sun shining through and the bright, bright rainbow in the sky. It was so beautiful. So think of the sky and the beauty that has been created by our God. And he holds it all in his hands, all these galaxies, stars, planets, moons, massive, massive things, more than we could even measure or understand. And he has set it all in place. He holds it all in his hands. So, again, I said before, we'll take the middle two verses, verses 4 and 5. We'll look at them last. So, for now, we'll skip over to verses 6 to 8. So we heard of the sky, the stars, the moon, the creation, the, all those things that were created. And then in verses 6 to 8, we see the animals being referred to, the works of creation that God has put on the earth. And as I mentioned first, this should bring us back to Genesis chapters 1 and 2, the creation story. We saw, if you're familiar with the story, God created it all. He said that it was good, that the creation was good, that it was very good. But yet, even with all that he created, he had a special place, he had a special task, and he had a special calling for humankind. So if you'd like to, I'm going to read a few verses from Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. So thinking about um, the special place that God had for humankind among his creation. So first from Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 31. So after God had gone through all the creation, the six days of creation... Um, 
we hear the man being referred to. So starting in verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God made man in his own image, in the image of God who created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. And then just one verse from chapter 2. Chapter 2, verses 15, that talks more about the role of the humans, of the role of the man in the garden. It says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. So that was his role in the garden, these roles. They were told to have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the livestock, every creeping thing on the earth. They were told to multiply over the earth and subdue it and fill it. And again, as I read in chapter 2, verse 15, Adam was told to work and to keep the Garden of Eden. So now flipping back over to Psalm 8 with these words in mind from the creation story. In Psalm 8 we hear again that mankind was given dominion over the sheep and oxen or the livestock, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea. So these words, the way that it's phrased, these similar words bring us back to the creation story. And David as he writes this psalm thanks God for the special place that we have been given on the earth. So are, are we thankful for this in the same way that we see in the psalm? Are we thankful for God's love for us, for the special place that He has for us, and that He has given us a role, a responsibility, and a purpose on the earth? Do we take this role seriously? Do we care for God's creation, and are we good stewards of it? And thirdly, do we appreciate God's purpose given to us to work that there was work from the beginning. God created work. I think this is something that's not thought about often, or I know I forget, that God created work, that work was created by God. It's not a part of the fall. Um, he gave Adam a job to do in the garden from the beginning. I know that in the past when I've been out of work for longer periods of time, and going months and months without working, and just sitting at home and doing whatever you would do with your free time, you realize that there is a purpose. There's something that's lacking when you're not working, when you're not completing something. Without it, life can feel empty. It can feel like you're lacking something. So do we thank God for our work? Do we thank God that He created work, that He provides those opportunities for us? For, I know that thinking of myself, too often I am ungrateful for the blessing and calling to work and, and the positions that I am able to do. So now we come to verses 4 and 5. We come to the central verses of the psalm. The focus of this chiastic structure that's meant to bring focus to these particular verses. So David has moved from first praising God and worshipping Him for His majestic name, then to reflecting on what God has created. Again, thinking back to Genesis 1 and 2, thinking back to the creation story and man's privileged place. And now we're here in verses 4 and 5. So I'll just read them as we get into them. Psalm 8, verses 4 and 5. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. So thinking of these verses, just thank God for his amazing grace that allows us such a privileged place in this world that he has created, that he has made. For, for what have we done that God should be mindful of us. That the God that created everything, that created the sun and the stars and the earth and all these things, that He should be mindful of us. What have we done to deserve that and to deserve His care, to deserve His love, His grace? We've done nothing. There is nothing that we could ever do to deserve it. 
No way that we could ever earn God's love, His care, His affection, His mercy, His grace, or anything else that He blesses us with. There's nothing that we can do to earn it. So what an amazing God. Thank you, Lord, that you bless us in ways that we do not deserve. But not only does He care for us, in verse 5 it continues and says that we have this place that is a little lower than the heavenly beings. That we are crowned with glory and honor among those on the earth. The Lord is the only one who deserves the glory and honor that is due His name, yet He allows us to have honor as His representatives on the earth. Sharing His gospel and His love with all peoples on the earth. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, Paul says, We are ambassadors for Christ, God making His appeal through us. So we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So we have a special place. We are ambassadors. We are God's representatives on the earth. And may we not take this blessed position before God for granted. For God has blessed us. He has given us so much. So may it pour out of us and may we be a blessing to the others that are around us. I'm going to flip again back to Genesis chapter 12 as God is speaking to Abram at the time before he was called Abraham. So now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to a land that I will show you and I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So this is what was told to Abram, the promise that was given to him by God, that he would be blessed, that God would bless Abram so that... He would be a blessing to others, to all the earth, through him and through those to come in his line. So think of these words and think that we are not blessed simply to keep it to ourselves, but to share it, to spread it around, to bless others with the hope and the news of eternal life that we have. So as we go from here this morning, reflecting on these words, may we leave here with a renewed sense of who God is as we see the worship of God of His created order through this song. How amazing and how majestic He is, His majestic name. And may we be thankful because of the love, the grace that He has for us, that God has given us a blessed place among all creation, among all things that He has made. And may we also be inspired by our Lord to act on His behalf, as I said here, to be His ambassadors to bless others through the blessings that we receive. Because He did not only give us this blessed place among creation, but more than that, He saved us. He offers us eternal life. He paid the ultimate sacrifice, sending His Son Jesus to die on our behalf that we might receive this eternal life, that we might have the opportunity to live and not have eternal damnation, not to have eternal death, but to have eternity with Him. Again, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, this morning. We thank you. How majestic is your name in all the earth, Lord. We thank you. Let's pray together. Lord God, you are so good. We just reflect on these words. We think of your creation. I think back to last week being able to share about creation with the kids at camp. Uh, just reflecting on your goodness, all that you've created that we can enjoy, Lord. You are so good, and we thank you for that. Um, yeah, we thank you just for the opportunity to reflect on these words, to think of how majestic you are, and yet you have blessed us immensely, Lord God. So I pray that going from here, we would not only reflect on you and how amazing you are, but how you have blessed us, that we may bless others, that we may bless those around us, Lord. And we thank you for that opportunity, and we pray that we would take it to heart, that we would take it seriously, Lord God, that you would work in each of us, in myself, and in all of us here this morning. We thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we sing our closing song.